What's going on? This is Seamus with the Educate to Elevate podcast back again, episode three. And I promised all my listeners that the only thing I was going to focus on was to bring people that brung value to the community. And this is my brother here. I lean on him for advice and stuff like that. My guy, Brandon Barnes out of Atlanta, Georgia. Brandon, introduce yourself. I know what you do. I don't think you need no introduction, but for the people that don't know, <laughs> tell them tell them what you do, uh, where bro, you're at. I appreciate it. For sure, for sure, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. Um, you know, like you said, here in Atlanta, Georgia, um, I've been here, like I started off, you know, grew up here, you know, moved away, had an opportunity to move back. And, it, you know, this thing called real estate wholesaling just kind of fell into my lap, you know, after getting fired from a job. And I ran with that um, and then started to educate others. To, you know, I had a monthly meetup group. Um, you know, we're still out here doing deals on a regular basis, but I spend a lot of time with my students as well. And, um, you know, real estate has just been the best thing for me. And, and it helped me start that journey, that entrepreneurial journey that I was always wanting, like from a young kid. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's so funny. As we go on that journey as a young kid and you start in entrepreneurship, it's hard to go to a nine to five. Like it's, it's almost impossible because you can see like there's a ceiling and you can't get past it. I think for me, I think I had maybe like, I'm 48. I think I had like six jobs in my whole life and none of them last longer than like 90 days. I was like, yo, this is not for me. <laughs> I can't, I can't do I it. Mean, I can't do it. We, we be the worst employees. Like real entrepreneurs at heart are the worst employees ultimately. Like, you know, maybe it'll work, but it's like trying to have a lion in a cage. Like he eventually going to try to break out the zoo. Yep. It's just what it is. Yes, yes. So you mentioned the meetup. That's the first time, I think the first time I met you was our REI Live meetup. And I think you had actually Brent Daniels there. And I was like, who is this guy, yep. Brandon? He knows Brent. He knows Jamil Pace. To me, I was like, there was no meetups in the city of Atlanta that brought that outside talent to Atlanta. So how did you come up with that concept and, and tell people a little bit about that? Yeah, no, good, good question. Um, like REI Live Atlanta kind of fell into my lap, like like a lot of things. Like, it, and it's you know, I know people talk about law of attraction and you know how you can just bring certain things your way, but it kind of starts from when I first got into real estate. Um, it was through like a a program that my buddy had that he shared with me. And as I started to listen to it, as I started to see the group, I had told my wife at the time. And we were just newly married, just a few months prior. I was like, you know, Tom Crow is going to know my name. Like, that was my thing. Like, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I want to get to the point where I'm doing deals. I'm, I got a, you know, healthy business. And from there, you know, I would start to go to the meetings. And I would start to make friends with a lot of the heavy hitters that came up through the Wholesaling Inc. group. And one of those folks that came through one of the meetings was Brian Tripp. And he had REI Live, the original REI Live in Birmingham. And he started to branch out into some different cities, came to Atlanta. Fortunately, who he came, you know, and, and started with in Atlanta, and he reached out to me to kind of pro help promote it. It just didn't work out. It wasn't a fit for who was going to, you know, kind of take that on. All the while, I'm wanting to be super low key. I wanted to be like, though I wanted Tom to know my name, like, I was trying to be the investor in the back, making my money, often quiet, you know, just because that's kind of how my my regular, my personality is or it was. And this fell into my lap to where he said, hey, you know, be the, you know, the guy just quit after two events. You know, can you take this over? And I was like, well, look, I, he actually asked me, do you know anybody that could take this over? I was like, yeah, I, got a, I know a few different people. And then he was like, no, I'm talking about you, bro. And, and so I, I went on and, I mean, after thinking about it, talking to my wife a little a bit, um, I went on and took that opportunity. And the main reason was just to grow, you know, and, and get uncomfortable being uncomfortable, which was something my mentor always said. And so, you know, by being, having that connection, and I'll tell you this, like when you're part of a program, a coaching program, a mentor, a mastermind, really network with the other people that are in it so that you can start to make friends. And then you see who the rising stars are. If you're a rising star as well, y'all will come up together and y'all always be friends. So Brent is a dude. 
you know, when I when I first got it going and it was time for me to get my own guests, I literally was like less than 30 days out and I called Brandon and then Brian was like, you think you're going to be able to get him that fast? I'm like, bro, he's, he's my guy. Apparently, I called yeah. him up yeah, and yeah, he yeah. was right there. He flew out, you know, two, three weeks later. And that's just, you know, about having, you know, solid connections and, and good relationships where, you know, you're trying to support others and, and be helpful. And it's funny that you say that because, so this is, this is my third episode and I got a list of about 20 people that, that agreed. When I, when I, when I'm finished with all those podcasts, they're going to be like, yo, this dude knows everybody in the industry, but it's because I either did some type of business, either helped them with social media marketing or they helped me and things like that. And it's important to lean on your community. You know what I'm saying? Well, look, let me, let me tell you about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Seamus, when, and when, I, when, I, when I did that event with Brent, like that was the second biggest one because when Tom Crow came, there was like 120 people there. Okay. When Brent came, it was like well over 150. It was a bigger room. I was scared shitless. <laughs> I, excuse my French. But you did a good job. You know, when I looked out, you was in the front row. Yeah, and for sure. every time, every time I did an event and I had another person, you're always, you was always in the front row. Yeah. And you was like, you know, giving me good energy. You was making me feel a little comfortable, a little bit more at ease. And yeah, you know, I appreciated it. And, and, and to your point, like you were bringing good energy to the events, you know, chatting with people, you know, making connections, but you was always in the front row and I always knock a look over and see my guy right there. So we just became fast friends the rest of history. Appreciate it. And it, it's funny. It's like last week I went out to an event in San Diego and I was right in the front. And mm -hmm. I didn't know who Jesse Itzler was. I'm like, who's, who's, mm -hmm. who's Jesse Itzler? Come to find yeah. out he's part owner of the Atlanta Hawks and mm -hmm. his wife owns Spanx. They just sold it for like $1.2 oh. billion, dollars, right? So he oh. starts talking about like he, how he grew up. He talked about like he used to break dance as a kid for money. I did the same thing. He comes from New York. <laughs> He was in the music yeah. industry and then he tells a story. But when he starts, when he first starts to talk about break dancing, he started talking about it. I said in a, on the front row, I said crazy legs. And he stopped and looked at me. He said, crazy yeah. legs was just at my house. He said maybe two more cents yeah. that he walked yeah. up. He was like, what's your name? I'm like, Seamus for 45 minutes. He kept saying my name. He's like me and Seamus are traveling yeah. across the world. And then he, it was so many things I knew that God put me in that seat, but I would have never been there if I wouldn't have been on the front row. So, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, another there's thing, a, there's, there's, there's super smart. So what was crazy is as he's telling a story, he says, you know, I, I got these Yankee tickets. They was called legend seats. They was a thousand dollars a game. I didn't know how I was going to pay for them, but I took them. He said, so then I came with the concept of like, Hey, I'm going to sell it to celebrities. And he says, guess who was the first celebrity that I sold it to? And he puts a picture up of him and Jay-Z. I started in the music industry with Jay. Jeez. I was ready to walk out. I'm like, hold on. This is crazy. <laughs> it was just like, it, I had a pivotal turning point right there. That, that guy had so many things. And there's some more stuff that going. I'm like, it, it's just crazy. But, you know, I yeah, always sit in the front row, bro. Like, I'm in the front. I want yeah. people to see me. And even like you and a lot of people that I'm friends with, I was telling my wife the other day, I said, these were people that when I first started, I said, I want these people to be my friends. And now I'm going to masterminds with people, have a dinner with people. To be honest, in some rooms, I'm like, yo, how did I get here? Like, how did I get, yeah, how did yeah. I get in this room? You know what I'm saying? Hey, so, that's, a, that's a hack. I mean, that's, I think that's a life hack, I think, for people to know. And like, just like I said, like, you, you definitely want to know your peers and your colleagues mm -hmm. in any mastermind, any meetup, any, any uh, training program. But even that, like, you know, sitting in the front room sitting in the front row of the room. You yeah. know, I think it's super important. Yeah, for sure. So tell, like, you grew up, I'm sure you grew up in, in, in the same similar type of situation. You know, parents wasn't wealthy. You know, we wasn't, you know, we couldn't afford Harvard and stuff like that. What was something, like a, a pivotal moment for you that made you say, I got to be the one to break this curse and I got to be the one to, like, change the trajectory for my whole family? Was there like a situation or something that you went through that, that caused that? Not, not really. And, and, and honestly, you know, for me, it was actually my dad 
who okay. was is is has been the first one to get the bag kind of in our in our family. Okay. But just like my parents and and, and me, you know, young parents. Yeah. They had my sister, so it's me and my sister, they had her at 20. Mm-hmm. You know, he 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 struggled to put himself through school. He actually got, you know, he had to get he had to leave college uh for a bit with, you know, Reagan mm-hmm. era rules or whatever. And so he was actually the first one to start down that path and it kind of was through basketball. But he, you know, had my sister at 20, me at 23. So they're young parents. So I grew up still in in poverty, like, you know, having to deal with those issues. But he kind of led that uh, charge for me, like before me. But at the same time, it was just me always wanting to, he would tell me like, hey, do you want a job that you would have some freedom? Do you want to not have to have the nine to five? It was really, I think, kind of that, that, you know, he started to say those things, um, but he was still talking about a job. And so it's funny that when I actually had the opportunity to go into real estate as an entrepreneur, he was still in the back of my head and in the back of my ear and and really in my face, you know, saying, are you sure about this? Are you sure about this? So I'm the first, you know, actually his brother was his entrepreneur as well. But like I'm the first, like out of our generation, you know, to go the entrepreneurial route. But it's still as a part of, you know, breaking generational curses, you know, because he's at the point where, you know, he's doing, you know, he's doing very well for himself. But we don't have no, you know, family tree full of, you know, you know millionaires, you know. Exactly. So everything is about legacy. And it was some of the things that he was teaching me early on. And I'm definitely blessed to have had a father that was there for me with like that. But at the same time, you know, I still had to strike out on my own as an entrepreneur because I was the one, you know, always trying to get the bag as a kid, selling candy, cutting grass. Or only went out of my crew to throw a party, house party, house parties in college. Like it just it's always been in my a bug that I've always had. And, you know, and and I think a lot of it was just goes back to wanting a better life, not mm-hmm. wanting to, you know, uh, ha- have like wanting that freedom and flexibility, but wanting to do it in a way that was different than what I had seen that I didn't yeah. have to go you know, get a nine to five like like my father did. Mm-hmm. And it, it's similar in in our in my case, my brother in law, he was the one that was like the entrepreneur type. You know, I grew up with my mm-hmm. mother. I was a trouble kid. I got kicked out of seventh grade with a firearm, like three schools in a month. My sister took me to upstate, Spring Valley, New York, where it was different. It was a house. I'm like a husband, a wife. Okay, I can't do this stuff. That's what changed everything for me. But he always used to tell me, similar to you, like, you got to start your own business and stuff like that. But then even with them and him, I seen some things and I'm like, I got to go a level above it. Like, I got, because you you can be a business owner and just have an expensive job. You know, I did that Mm -hmm. for 16 years. Like, I wanted to, I quit many, I quit many a times and realized that I I owned a company. I had to come back, you know? (laughs) So, you know, to, to have that mindset shift to, you know, like, I want to be able to go at my pace, move how I want to move. That's something I think that you have to dig down internally and look at, like, everything around you and just and just uh, audit, you know, be able to be audible yeah. and just move in different things. So I heard you say basketball, all right? Let's talk about playing ball. D- did you play ball? I'm yeah. from the Bronx. I'm a point guard. I don't got no yeah. jump shot. But I can get the oop and I can get the ball up the court. Where did you play ball? And I meant I heard you say your father played. You know, came through ball. Yeah, How did that work? Yeah, all the crazy. I mean, and coming out of Chicago and, and like I was born up there, but the whole family is up there. Like he came behind Terry Cummins. He okay. Terry Cummins. I think it was a senior when he was a freshman. He was the first freshman to make, to make varsity, and then the next freshman was Tim Hardaway. Was a freshman when he was a senior, and so it's in it's in our blood. You know, he, that's how he, he was he was about to go with a scholarship. And and the the thing, though, was that then when he came and, and he put coaching basketball and actually coaching girls because my sister was first. Okay. He put coaching really before, you know, growing a, in his corporate role. And so that we he had those glass ceilings working for Coca-Cola here in the city. Now, then I came up hooping, you know, played at Shambly, you know, but I wasn't as committed and devoted to the game 
because I always had a, my, my mind on getting Money this bag and having a job, bro. <laughs> so I, 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 I was done. And, and there, was, there was some hot freshmen that came up behind me when I was a sophomore. Um, but like I had already had a job at Brewster. So I, and, and being here in Atlanta, bro, like I've, I've, been in, I've been in a lot of different you know, scenarios and situations because the account that I had with Brewster's, like we were just handing out coupons before I was actually able to get a W-2. And so I'm working in Phillips Arena, Turner, uh, Turner Field, uh, Georgia Dome. I'm like going through the loading dock, seeing Mike Vick walk up, the, you know what I mean, the, the ramp, going to the game. So I, I you know, and, and then the, the home store was downtown on Broad Street, right in the heart of the city. And so like that, you know, opened my eyes to just me having my own money. And then I was also able to open up the first DTLR on Memorial Drive. And when Jeezy came out, really Jeezy came through there, like, Yes, we you had a I, DTLR. There was a lot of other stuff. Yes, what? I opened the DTLR on Memorial Drive, Memorial Bend here on the East Side of Atlanta. Wow! So I worked there from junior to senior year through went away to college, and I haven't really put this on wax before, but I actually started off at Tennessee State University, following my sister. Okay. Um, but bro, I didn't even make it through homecoming. I got kicked out first semester selling <laughs> weed on campus. Bro, it and happens, so, bro. It, we it happens. It's the entrepreneur. You can't you you can't stop hustling. You can't. And so just like you said, like you know, trouble youth. Like I I got put out. Like I had this track to go. You know, through college and all this stuff. I got put out and I had to come home, start start over at community college and work my way up. And, you know, it, it, it just, when it's in you, like it's in you, 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 you have to, you know, lean into that. Yeah. And, and really go and chase those dreams as an entrepreneur, uh, regardless of the scenario. So, you know, different things led to different things, but, you know, the best thing that ever happened to me was actually then getting fired and finding real estate, bro. Yeah. This is yeah. the best. It, it's funny that you say that. Like, I grew up, like, and I, I told the story on uh, on a podcast before. In my building in the Bronx, it was 36 apartments. Half was weed, crack, heroin, right? What I would do is I would go to the apartments at like seven, eight years old and tell them like, hey, if you need something from the store, I'll charge you a dollar because if you leave and they knock on your door for weed, you're going to lose a customer, right? So I took a bunch of them down to the corner store and told them like, hey, if he come down here to buy Dutchess or cigarettes or beer, it's not for him, it's for them. And my mother used to be like, yo, where the hell are you getting this money from? I'm like, I'm running to the stores for everybody. (laughs) Then I used to buy candy. I used to get up earlier than everybody else, go to the store, tell you my age. I used to buy penny candies. And I knew the kids wasn't going to get up earlier than me. So when I get in school, I would buy 100 penny candies. I'm like, yo, these is five cents. Or you could wait till three o'clock. You need that sugar rush. But that was like my first, like, you know, shot at entrepreneurship, like eight years old. Like I, I was doing that. And then like I grew up on the streets, like all of the hustlers used to buy me my graduation suits and all type of stuff. And I tell people when we start talking about illegal stuff, I should have been under the jail with all the stuff that I was doing. But with the (laughs) grace of God, I was able to walk away uh, with a clean state. You know what I'm saying? It's it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, But, you know, believe it or not, like I would then go on, get an opportunity to go to another college. I'm in my whole thing was I always wanted to remain in the South. Okay. And because I got kicked out and came back, then... The, the the change was my pops was like you need to go somewhere else you need to go up north so I ended up going to Purdue and okay. graduating from Purdue there we go but my goal because I because because you know they, they my my folks made sure that I had and here even locally you know better education so I tested into the magnet program took two buses to school elementary okay. middle high okay and so they prepped me for college so my goal was to Tennessee State and then Vanderbilt once I got kicked out and that derail I did. Georgia Perimeter, Georgia State, Purdue. Okay. And that change, seeing that difference from the North and the South was eye-opening. It, it, it definitely helped balance me out. And they gave me an opportunity to go work in Pittsburgh for the H.J. Hines company. Okay. Even in turn, like in Europe, you know, for one of the semesters. So a, a lot of those different experiences, like, really helped out. But even... You know, I finally put that, put you know, uh, stop hustling, you know, the illegal way. But 
it, that was after, like, even I done made it to the next school and still doing the same stuff that got me locked up before. And so it's, it, it's, it's tough to get away from it. It is. But, you know, it's, it's preparing us for, you know, other opportunities more legally. And I do feel like there's a lot of opportunities. There's still opportunities to, to make money in different types of ways. Mm-hmm. But with the internet being and the social media being so widespread, there's so many opportunities for people to make money yeah. on the internet the right way. So I th- I just think it's great that you're doing what you're doing and also sharing different people's experiences and stories. Appreciate so somebody it. can be inspired by that and go and find their path and don't run the risk that me and you did exactly. growing up, bro. Exactly. <laughs> it's crazy. And, and, and it's funny because when I first came down to Atlanta, I was still hustling. Like I'm, I'm, I'm out on the ball court playing with Tim's on and stuff like that. They're like, yo, this dude gotta be from New York. I ain't got no sneakers on yes. or nothing. But I remember telling God, I was like, listen, if you can just give me a shot at something where I, that I don't jeopardize my safety for my family, I'll, I'll go all in. And that was my uniform company. I started in 2004, wound up building that up to seven figures. But from that day on, I never touched anything illegal. But you, growing up in areas where we come from, like we don't have like nowadays with the internet, you can go online and look and find road models. Oh, I want to be like Brandon. I want to be like Seamus. Cool. Back then we didn't have we didn't have that. It was like no. who was in the hood? What was they doing? They was trapping. They was hustling. You know, rapping we, or playing ball. Exactly. And, yo, I swear, if you look in my yearbook, it says, "What do you want to do?" It's like a rapper or play ball. That was the only two Man. things. And I got far with the rap, and I had records that was on Billboard and stuff like that. But then again, I didn't know anything about business. Yeah. I was like, man, I turned down seven figure checks and I'm like, nah, because I want to own my masters and stuff like that. And then being around people like Jay-Z and stuff like that, I'm like, man, this is the route that I want to go. So I, I completely understand, you know? So yeah. with, with, with real estate, you, I know you do fix and flips. Uh, you do a lot of hoteling and, and tell a little bit about like your structure, your business, like what your numbers look like as far as like what's your goal and how many flips and stuff like that for everybody. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, good question. Um, like, so when I started out, you know, it, it was, uh, I think a lot of people that start off, I think wholesaling is the cornerstone of all real estate because it'll show you how to find the right property. So if you start from that and never forget it, you'll always be able to have that opportunity to purchase right. You know, especially yeah, if you have true. the time and, 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 and the ability to actually go out and, and do the work to find the properties. And so it was all about making six figures. And then it got to a point where, you know, I said, hey, you know, I needed to bring somebody on to help me, you know, grow so I'm not just running myself ragged. And then it's, you know, all right, let's do multiple six figures. Let's do, let's do seven figures. And so for us, I'm, I'm trying to continue to grow, you know, as I, I started by myself, I had a partner, then we separated once I started coaching and doing the, and the, um, and the meetups. So that I had to rebuild the business right before COVID started. And we've already built that thing right back up to seven figures. So, you know, don't think that real estate, you know, there aren't opportunities out here because there definitely are. But at this point, like I want to grow it to a nice sizable anywhere from, you know, 1.2, 2.5 or, you know, in, in, in that, you know, one to three, you know, seven, you know, seven figure range. And then just hold, like hold it there as a means of generating leads and opportunities. Because I think from what I've seen and and from talking to peers, if you really chase having the biggest, baddest wholesale operation, you're going to be on a constant treadmill that it starts, you know, the more money you spend and put into it and the dump to to, to have a bigger business, the, 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 the less your margins will end up being. And so we've gotten to a point where, you know, I could have like a nice, a nice team of 10 team members and easily do 1.5 to 3 mil. Yeah. And, and that, then that becomes just a means of finding good properties and opportunities. And now that's single family though. I've, I do want to get into multifamily and do more of that because you can apply the same wholesaling principles to multifamily. But, you know, if, you know, you add that bag on you, maybe we might be at five to 10 M's, but for me, I mean, I, I enjoy coaching, teaching, like I said, through the basketball thing. My mom was a teacher. My sister was a teacher. My wife was a teacher. So it's in me. And so the education business was the perfect thing that fell into my lap. 
to where, you know, I get this team to where we're doing, you know, uh, 10, 10 or so deals a month, something like that. I can find good properties through that. I'll go on, I'll be moving on and in, into, you know, the multifamily space while I'm running the education business. Like that's what things look like for me. And, and, and it's extremely important that you learn to fire yourself. Because I remember when I closed, mm-hmm. we, we did seven figures, right? In the uniform business, had a factory in the Philippines and ported from China. And that same year, I closed it down. I was like, I can't do this no more. And mm-hmm. the first book I read was the four-hour work week. I'm like, yo, this dude is making fun of me because exactly what he said was <laughs> was going to happen to me, you know? And then I started reading yeah. more business books and understand it, you know, started to understand about KPIs and SOPs. But it's extremely important because I'm in the same, you know, in the lane as far as like, I don't want 50 people or 100 people. I want a team of exactly. 10 people, 15 people, but we can execute efficiently and we know our numbers where, you know, you can have 10 people or 15 people and be doing quarter million dollar months, exactly. you know, instead of just going exactly. everywhere. So what's, I like to ask this question, what's one myth about wholesaling that you would like to address? Bro, that, that's a great question. There's a few. There's a few. Um, the easiest one to attack is like that wholesalers are just taking advantages of of like little old ladies and homeowners and then robbing them of their house and equity. Like that's that's absolute BS. Yeah. Um, but the, oftentimes when you see stories like that, they're manipulating the data to make it mm-hmm. seem like you're taking a house at you know twenty five cents on a dollar when. They're using Zillow to comp the property. You know? <laughs> we know how that uh, goes. <laughs> you know how that goes. And we do a good job. And I think that this is something that the industry has to move to. And, I, and, I, and I'm uh, proud of seeing people trying to help build, you know, um, um, get wholesalers together to organize and, um, you know, start with disclosures and disclaimers to sellers. But even if, you know, you're not there yet, like, if you're getting into this business and wholesaling is just the art of finding properties off market at a discount, period. Like that is what wholesaling is. And when you're speaking to homeowners, let them know, you know, up front as early as possible. And of course, this wasn't me in the beginning that, you know, we will purchase the home sometimes to flip it, to, you know, rehab it, to hold it. But oftentimes, majority of the times even, we're going to resell the property for profit. Mm-hmm. Like letting them know that early on in the process and, and early on in, in, in your career, you will start to build a business that, you know, you can stand by, that you can, you know, have, you know, you'll get good reviews. It, it'll actually end up being an easier transaction mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the day once you start doing the inspection in the open house because the, the, the homeowner will know what it is that you're trying to do because you let them know that. And, It'll potentially keep you out of real estate jail and all the things that are coming down the pipe for us as as wholesalers, as they're going to try to regulate and, and and tell us that we're we're not doing stuff right. So let folks know up front what what it is you do, and um, with that, if I could add this one thing, is understand your value in the market because we make it to where a homeowner can sell a house as is at their price point without lifting a finger. So we're offering speed mm-hmm. or the best timing because sometimes they need more time. Sometimes they need, you know, time after closing. We're, we're, we're offering, you know, um, a, known, a known price, a known timeline and convenience. And for that, we, that we have to make money too. That's what we offer. And if you lean on that, you can let them know what it is you're doing because you're still offering a service that a real estate agent can do and a cash buyer investor don't know how to do. Yeah, that's 100% true. It's like being transparent with the homeowner up front. I think that's just good business principles. And anytime you, any business transaction, let them know. And like you said, in the beginning, you may not do that because you want to get your couple of deals or you want to build the money up. But I think that it comes... To, to to the main point is and and, and you're just learning your way exactly you're, you're learning your way you're trying to get the experience in the beginning so I don't like I definitely say hey you know we you know sometimes we we flip and we rehab properties and I wasn't doing that at the time mm-hmm. 
but I didn't know how to communicate yeah. what I didn't know. It, it comes with time. But as soon as you get that. Yeah, it, it yes, comes with time talking to, to homeowners, open. being confident on the phone and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, yeah, if you ain't getting cursed out or, you know, getting a middle finger emojis in the text replies, you're not doing your job. <laughs> it's like when I tell the cold calls, yeah. I'm like, listen, you're, you're probably going to get cursed out every single day. So what do you think that it, what do you think it takes to be successful wholesaling? Yeah. Bro, it's just consistency. Um, that at the end of the day is just getting up and doing the work every day because it is a number game. It's a numbers game. And and I talk about making sure that with those numbers that you always send the offer. And like that's my whole thing. Send more offers. I'm the send more offers guy. Because I want, you know, anybody that I work with, I want our team to make sure that they're actually completing the play. Like, like Yes, it's cool to talk to somebody. Yes, it's cool to walk them through and give them price. But if you don't physically actually send them an offer, you have no chance of doing that deal. True. Like maybe, maybe a verbal offer, they'll come back and say, yes, I want to I do business with you. Send me the offer. Maybe. But if you lead first with like, hey, I'm going to take them through the process and actually submit the offer, you know, you have an actual chance of, of doing a deal. So you're just doing that and doing it consistently. If you do that, it's just a numbers game. You're going to get a lot of no's. You'll get those yeses, and you'll do deals. So you mentioned send more offers. Like, tell us a little bit about that. You know, I know that's your program and everything. So explain that a little bit about the send more offers. Yeah. So part of, like, bro, like I said in the beginning, I, you know, like I'm not, you know, just, uh, I, I never was wanting to be like, you know, super in the limelight. I wanted to get my bag. I wanted to, you know, support my family and, 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 and live life and enjoy. But when that opportunity fell into my lap by just being, you know, networking and being friends with and supporting my friends through um, the, the Wholesaling Inc. family and that coaching, uh, that, that, that event, um, the whole um, REI Live Atlanta opportunity came up. You know, part of running a local monthly meetup and, you know, we always brought the biggest and best uh, guests to the city was that people are going to keep coming up and asking about how you got to this point. How do you do deals? I want to learn. And so from there, naturally, it said, you know, hey, I'm going to have a program where I teach people. And when I really, really narrowed down what I do differently than others, it was that my team, instead of using an auto dialer, we did a lot of cold calling, instead of using an auto dialer to just generate the, generate the lead and send it to a CRM, we set a system of keeping it in the, the dialer because I thought that, that, you know, at the time, that was the best way that I could talk to a bunch of people at any one given time and let our acquisition managers talk to them also at that same high rate show them how to comp a property without looking at it, without being there, using the map that's given on Zillow based off the price and being able to take everybody through that process at a fast pace and submit an offer. And, and our biggest KPIs was how many offers did we submit last week? You know, if every, we get every 25 out, we should get one signed. And so I just, I just narrowed that down into the Similar Offers Coaching Program um, at SimilarsOffers.com. Um, you know, that's where I, you know, I have a group of uh, students. A lot of them are in Atlanta, but a lot of them are nationwide. Uh, we meet weekly. We meet on Zoom, Facebook group, you know, podcasts, everything else. And a lot of people are doing a lot of deals by just that one little tweak to their business of actually sending the offer. I, I'm not going to lie. When we got, when we talked, I think it was like Thursday of last week. As soon as we got the phone call, yeah. I think I sent out like four offers. I'm like, man, he's right, man. I'm just going to send them. I'm trying to do like 25 <laughs> a week. I sent them out. I gave them a number. Yeah. And I used exactly what you said when they, because you know, you'll have a homeowner that'll be like, I want 400000 for the property. And you look at it, it's 150000 on Zillow. So I'm like, listen, I'll shop. Mm-hmm. I did exactly what you, I'll, I'll shop in my pencil. Let me shoot you a number. And I just, and I just sent them out. And one mm-hmm. of them was the one that the guy is getting ready to sign. And I'm like, you know what? So, yeah. I, so what I try to do there now is I said, I try to make 50 calls, at least 50 calls a day. I try to have about 10 to 15 conversations. And I'm, and my number to get up to is to send out 50 offers a week. That's 10 a day, yes. you know? So yes. if I get that, like you said, if you know your KPIs yeah, and it's tracking, you know, it takes one to every 25, 
that's eight deals a month. And if your spread is 15, 20, 30 K, you talk about six figures, you know, and that changes there you go. a lot of people's lives when you be able to, you know, when you could pay yourself 30 K a month or 40 K a month, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. I mean, bro, it's, it's so much to set up when you get going that you almost forget that. You know, oh, I did. You didn't send that offer. You didn't really. I did. <laughs> you didn't really finish <laughs> the play. You know what I mean? And and you got a lot of everybody got a lot of stuff going. You just forget that piece. And once you make that nice that that slight switch, you know what I mean? It, it helps. Um, but I also think that you know people don't feel comfortable coming up with that offer price, and we we yeah. like to really do it in ranges. But if I go, if anybody gives me a property anywhere in the country right now, I can go on my phone, look on Zillow, draw a map around that property, see every comp that sold, and see where the as is sales price is. Okay. And if I want to make 10K on that deal, I just go in 10K less than what the as is sale happened gotcha. for in that neighborhood, similar house, and that's my maximum allowable offer. If you use that principle, you can comp any property in the country just based off of Zillow while you're in a live conversation with that homeowner. Yeah, which is and that's what we do. Which is extremely important. And it's funny that you say that because, you know, I just relaunched Magneto Homes in January. So I'm yeah. building out. Yeah. I went from Podio to RVI Simply, managing the cold call, doing all these sheets. And when we talked, I was like, damn, I'm doing all of this. I got my systems right. I'm like, I need to get to the offers every single week, 25 to 50 there offers. So now it's like yeah. I got my numbers and I'm doing it. Whether, whether it's $100,000 off or $200,000 off, I'm just going to send you the offer. If I know your price is crazy, I'm just going to send it to you because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When you talk to 15 other investors and they give you lower prices than I did, and you see nobody's giving you the $400,000, you are going to look back on that contract and be like, damn, he did offer me this for the property. So He did, yeah. And he did send, yeah, exactly. he did send me something. I got something from him. Like, it becomes the offer becomes another marketing piece. Bro. Exactly. Like that 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 keeps the conversation going. Now you got a reason to call them back. Hey, did you get the offer? Exactly. What'd you think? Exactly. And it's, it's all about there conversations and just and just building that. What's some advice you would give to new wholesalers? Yeah, I mean, the consistency is key. Um, coaching, mentoring. Um, but I, I think I've been liking something I've heard a lot recently. You know, it, it's important to stay around the fire, right? Mm -hmm. right? It's important to be in the mix, you know, and I know even with COVID, a lot of events aren't happening, like even if it's on social media, even if it's in a Facebook group, um, it's, it's easy to be isolated when you're trying to do this business early on. Um, but, you know, go to properties early on, experience it, walk it, understand what you're dealing with, and then network with other wholesalers in your, in, in your area, other investors. So you can start to build something. And when you're ready, look, you're not going to get where you want to be without somebody giving you the blueprint. You know what I mean? It's, it's hard to reinvent the wheel. So then you go after coaching and be hella consistent. You'll, you'll, you'll do numbers. Yeah. And you know, most people don't understand. It's like, it's extremely important to invest into mentors, to cut the learning curve. Like last oh, year, sure. I was talking about this the other day. Last year, I spent a hundred grand on mentors and masterminds. And my buddy's like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, well, there's somewhere that I want to get to, you know what I'm saying? There's somewhere and they know something that I don't, I don't know. You know, my goal this year is to spend 250. I got a couple of people and I'm like, I, it's going to cost me 50 to work with him. But if I know you're where I want to be and you can cut that learning curve, I want to, I want to spend that money with you. And it's important also too, you could give your money to the wrong mentor. I did that before. Where I'm like, man, this yeah. dude didn't, yeah. didn't teach me nothing. He ain't have the best interests at heart. So you definitely got to do your due diligence with, you know, who you're spending with. But I would advise people, if you can afford to spend money on mentorships and courses. Man, in my Google Drive, I got so many courses. Bro, I know. Look, Seamus is the, is the course king. Like, you know what I mean? And, and there's a reason why you're here right now, though, bro. Because... It is you're not you weren't you know unwilling to invest in education, yeah. and I think that that's something that a lot of people you know are holding you know close to their chest, holding their finances and funds, and maybe they don't have the ability to, you know, you know get into some of those other groups, get into the free opportunities, exactly. the free mentorships, or you know, and and make sure. Like the funny thing is, when I started wholesaling, my buddy gave me the course to wholesaling Inc. 
But I said when I get my first deal, I'll buy, buy that thing. Because now I can speak to the coach. Yeah, and yeah, now yeah, that's important. I just went down and met with Tom in Florida in December. Yeah. Like he's my he's my homie. And it was only because I bought, I paid the money yeah. to join it, even though I had the free course. Yeah. And, and that's just like, you know, you, people need to make sure that they're they're doing what they can to be around the right people. Yeah, 100 percent What do you do you, do you read a lot? If you do, because I, I know you're always having books and everything, what's something that you may have read or listened to lately that inspired you? Yeah, man. I I, I wish I had enough time. I got hella books. <laughs> hella books. They, they it, It's hard finding time to read, man. I got five kids, and it's, it's tough. But what I do do is at when I do grab a book and I've, I've been a lot better about this recently, like I, at least I open it, I go through the index, I look at the whole thing, you know, I, and, and, and I'll at least spend some time getting something out of it. Um, but the most recent um, book that is super important, I think that everybody should check out um, is um, Profit First for Real Estate Investors. Okay. Now, it's not like the most, you know, it, it, it actually is. I, I'm, I'm going to say it, it can be kind of the most mind-blowing thing when, you're, when you've been in this business for a while and the finances have been tough. Like It can really expand your mind. But you know, I know there's a bunch of great books out there. But, you know, if, I, if you really live that model, you will set yourself up for financial success to where you're not always in that rat race. So that is the most, the most recent book. Um, that I actually um, read a few pages of. Okay, uh, okay. Um, I'm feeling about halfway through, okay. but um, I at least got the concepts down to make sure that, um, you know, things are, you know, being, you know, positioned in the right way. So Profit First is um, um, David Richter. Okay, I'm going to check that dude. one out. I'm going to recommend one, The 12-Week Year. Mm. When I read that book... Is that, is that also by... Is uh, Brian, uh, I think Week? Brian Morgan. I think his, name, his first name is Brian. Uh, okay, okay. But that book basically turned up my sense of urgency. Like I used to be able to see a bottle sitting on my dresser and be like, I'll take it out tomorrow. Now I'm like, I got to take it out right now. Like it just turned up the sense of right. urgency. Basically every month is a week. Every week is a day. Every day is an hour. So mm-hmm. it makes you think about things like I don't have 12 months to really execute on things. And I implemented, I got the workbook and everything. You keep lead and lag indicators. So, you know, like for instance, if I got to make 50 calls a day, if I only made 15, when I get in the next day, I try to make 65 or 75 to catch up for it. Like it just builds it. it. It's a great book. If you get a chance. I'm going to definitely check that out. Check it out. I appreciate it. What, uh, what does your legacy look like in 10 to 20 years? Where do you see Brandon? Mm, that's a that's a deep one. Um, I mean, I see some of these kids uh, getting closer to that high school graduation. That's for sure. <laughs> um, in the next ten, 10 years, but I mean, honestly, um, like I I I really enjoy the education piece. Okay. I really enjoy you know being able to you know help people achieve those goals and you know sharing the gift that I have. Um, through real estate and entrepreneurship stuff, I, I, I really want to make sure that, you know, I have, you know, students that can really, you know, speak highly of the education and the opportunity that they got through anything that I was able to provide and share with them uh, to really get going. But there's that and then uh, to the financial piece, just, you know, can, having even more time freedom than I do currently um, definitely want to have some multifamilies on the board um, by then, and um, you know, uh, be able to you know being able to spend time how I want to. Bro. Yeah, and 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 that's the key, man. I think that what the super successful people do is they buy their time back. Like oh, yeah. they pay people to do everything. Oh, yeah. Like you know, pay people to send emails, answer the email from your wife, and just pay it. You know what the answer is going to be? Just do it. You buy your time back, and I think that's super important. And then it's also super important to learn how to just remove yourself from the business as fast as yes. possible. Like, you know, don't take six months to do something. I was telling somebody the other day, they was calling me, asking me for some advice and everything. I'm like, the first thing you got to do is you got to learn to outsource things that you are not good at fast. Don't continue to do things oh, that you don't, sure. if you don't like cold calling, pay somebody seven dollars an hour to cold call for you, you know? But your time, I I told my son yesterday, I said, what's the difference between somebody making $10 an hour and $500 an hour? And he was like, 
he looked at me and I was like, skill set. It's the same 60 minutes, but he got paid 500 for his. You got paid $10 for yours. So you got to, and it's funny when I hear people say, well, I can't make more money. Learn a different skill set. Just learn, learn a different <laughs> skill set, put some time in to exactly. do it, and then shift industries. I'm always, from when we first met, you know, I, I pivoted to several different industries. Oh, yeah. You know, so. Oh, yeah. It, it, and, and that's important. And, and you won't have the opportunity to do that if you don't have that time freedom, yeah, to your point. 100%. And even, I mean, with the, all the kids, like we had, you know, have uh, the laundry service. So, you know, cleaner, mm-hmm. like. Um, even cooks, you know, my lovely sister, it, you know, prepared some meals for us to make sure that we're in a good situation so that we can, you know, always, you know, make sure that we're having a, you're having those square meals. And it's funny that my, my acquisition manager was saying that he came to me and was like, yeah, man, we, I'm going to go out and I'm gonna hire a chef. I'm, I'm, I'm about to do it. I think I'm a break even, you know, on the money. But when you think about That's it, like time. even doing stuff like that, if you're, if you're that entrepreneur, you you, you have a business. That time is so, so, so important that, you know, it actually will get you that time back to go make more money and be more impactful to your business and, and to your family. 100%. So, Brandon, man, my brother, you know, it's always good talking. I appreciate you taking the time out because I see you on Instagram. I'm like, this dude got to start in five. Oh, and I know you went to Purdue. My school... <laughs> I wanted to play at St. Yeah. John. So we probably would have played against each other. I was a Redmond, you know? Right, right, um, but, right. But tell everybody where they could find you, your social media. And I'm going to just recommend the course because when, when I got the course, I went through it and it was so detailed in things that you could implement like right away. So tell people where they could find the course about your coaching program, uh, your Instagram and everything. Yeah, no, for sure, bro. I appreciate you. Um, and, you know, if anybody heads over to sendmoreoffers.com, send more offers, um, you can learn about the course, the program, and it also has links to my social at uh, I am B Barnes. And, um, you know, we do live trainings uh, each week, most every week on Fridays through the Send More Offers Mastermind Facebook group. So if you check it out there, if you find the link um, on my IG, um, it's in the bio. I would love to have you and get some of the free game that we're giving every Friday on how you can go out and literally send offers, properties you've never been to, and do deals That's without, awesome. without driving around the city. Yes, yes. And in, in the show notes, we'll have all of the, the contact information to the send more offers, to the course, and to everything. But my brother, Brandon, I appreciate you. I know we're probably going to be on the phone later or tomorrow like that, but I appreciate you taking the time out, man. And that's, you know, you've been, and and what's funny is like, I I was telling my wife, I'm like, he's one of the most genuine dudes that I know, like from day one. Like, if you remember the first time when at the Brent, you was like, come have dinner with us. And I was like, he he talking to me? Like, okay. Oh, I forgot about that. I forgot about that. I was like, yo, he he a good dude right there. So that was the first time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) So I appreciate you, man. Thank you for uh, for stopping in, taking the time out and uh, and stay blessed, bro. 